Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no Godzilla, sorry. Um, and other effects on biodiversity and ecosystems. And, and so I'm just going to, I don't have a lot of time, I've been rambling, uh, but let me uh, just sort of hit some of the highlights of our work very, very quickly and I'll screen through a bunch of these slides just because they're my props. Um, so, you know, the first, the first, so the first issue is, does radiation at these dose rates cause genetic damage in simple terms? And there's lots of ways you can look at that and, and uh, we've done a whole bunch of this kind of study uh, published two dozen papers related to that. To summarize it though, our first sort of meta-analysis of what was known about genetic damage caused by Chernobyl radiation. So radiation has been known to cause genetic damage for over a century. Uh, you know, Mueller won the Nobel Prize in the 20s for it on Drosophila. Uh, but, but nobody had been looking really rigorously at low dose radiation effects like we see in Chernobyl. So our first attempt was a meta-analysis published in, 1980, in 2006, the same time as this Chernobyl Forum report was published. In fact, this, we wrote this review for Trends in Ecology and Evolution for it to contrast with that Chernobyl Forum report. Basically shows that in almost all of the studies that we could find from both the Eastern and Western literature that tested this hypothesis, most of them showed some level of genetic damage or increased mutation rates in response to, to Chernobyl radiation. It was kind of really open and shut case. None of these studies were referenced in the Chernobyl form report. And certainly our review was not. <laughs> uh, we, uh, last year we updated our, our analysis because there's been a lot happening in the last 10 years. And so we added to the analysis and and brought in some more advanced statistical methods to do this meta-analysis of genetic effects, uh, published this review, which, which also has not been cited by the IEAE. Uh, but it basically showed that huge effects of radiation on genetic damage of various sorts for various organisms. Uh, this graph, again, I'm not gonna bore you with the details. All it really shows is that most of the studies that have been done show very large and significant genetic consequences of, of the radiation. Um, I just really uh, was going to show this slide because it gives me an excuse to say something really, you know, but one of my, my master's advisor told me you have to have a sexy part of your talk, right? So, um, so the sexy part of my talks relate to uh, the fact that we use uh, male gametes. What's a male gamete? Any biology students? <laughs> Sperm. Sperm. <laughs> we uh, make use of, and this, we'll see if it works here. Uh, does it work? Is my video gonna work? Ah, oh, there we go. Uh, we, we developed a technique, uh, a special kind of Japanese massage method for <laughs> gently removing the, the uh, biological materials from male birds that we, we, we caught and allowing us to recover this genetic material without hurting the animals in any way. And, and we've used this to look at the behavior of sperm as well as morphological changes, again, as a proxy for genetic damage. And basically, when we do this, we've done this for a number of a whole bunch of different species of birds and small mammals. And the basic, the basic result is that the combination of increased radiation levels and increased oxidative stress or lower levels of antioxidants leads to poorer performing sperm uh, in general and higher le degree levels of malformed sperm in, in a number of different organisms. And in fact, in the hottest parts of Chernobyl, the, uh, many of the birds are completely sterile, up to 40% are completely sterile in the so-called red forest area of Chernobyl. Again, from a medical standpoint, maybe not that surprising, uh, you know, cancer therapy patients are often, radiation therapy cancer patients are often told to bank their sperm if they're considering procreation at a later date because sterility part-time, part or full-time or complete uh, is one of the consequences. Uh, and this, this one really caught my attention. Some group at Oxford has decided that uh, they should be treating sterility in humans with antioxidants, again, supporting the notion that oxidative stress is uh, an important issue. 
Uh, also looked at, again, this kind of thing in plants, for the plant people in the audience. Pollen, uh, this, again, this is our latest paper, uh, should be out any day on the stands, and it basically shows that radiation uh, is a major contributor to pollen inviability, which is a contributor to plant fertility, plant productivity. And the next thing you think about, so genetic damage, pretty much a done deal. We know that it's affected. The next thing everybody thinks about is cancer. Uh, what, a lot of what we know about cancer effects and radiation come from atomic bomb survivor studies where cancer rates go up linearly with, with radiation dose. When we look at the birds and the animals, uh, again, we find the same basic patterns, even for Chernobyl levels of radiation, with lots of examples of critters with, with strange and unusual tumors, uh, and uh, uh, you know patches, you know, a lot of the tumors on the head for some strange reason, but, but sometimes on the wings and on their feet. So, you know, again, uh, the animals are showing these kinds of consequences. Uh, one of the other, one of the first discoveries, medical discoveries related to radiation use in the 20s and 30s, when they first started using x-rays and radium to treat cancer, uh, in the 1930s they noticed that if, if women were pregnant at the time, their child, their children, often had strange eye developmental abnormalities, cataracts, and other kinds of things, other kinds of issues, even as children. And, uh, and this, this was also noticed in atomic bomb survivors. So again, children who were exposed ended up with cataracts in their eyes. And so that inspired us to look at Chernobyl. And sure enough, the birds of Chernobyl have higher levels of cataracts. Uh, uh, in fact, I have to get a some cataract surgery next month myself, but anyway. Maybe because of where you live? Well, you know, that's a good point. <laughs> well, we'll your yeah. yeah, you know, the water from, yeah, anyway. The, the birds have cataracts, the mice have cataracts. Uh, so, you know, again, all of these sort of indicators of radiation exposure. Um, I mentioned the story earlier today about the fact that atomic bomb survivors, uh, women who were pregnant at the time, tended to have children with smaller brains and other kinds of mental issues, cognitive issues. Same thing with the birds and the mice. Uh, and uh, so, you know, again, basically we see all of the same kinds of issues that, that were seen in atomic bomb survivor studies in Chernobyl, as well as in Fukushima. Uh, the plants are affected, plant developmental issues. This, this, this picture is, is, was made a little bit famous uh, because it was used as the cover on the cover of a book by Alexei Yablokov et al., published in 1979, called uh, Chernobyl, the Catastrophe and its Consequences for the environment, People in the Environment. Um, anyway, it uh, was a rather controversial book, uh, paid for by Greenpeace, uh, where he actually estimated that the human death toll was closer to a million, uh, but again, very controversial. But anyway, the trees, are affected, the plants are affected. Uh, this is a Chernobyl, I probably should hand some, right? Uh, we have quite a bit of time, so if you want oh, okay. to have, okay. a, have a few more minutes. Oh, okay, good. Um, the, uh, the trees grow in strange uh, shapes because the apical growing tips uh, get killed, and so the trees lo lose dominance, their apical dominance, and they start looking really kind of uh, unusual, uh, and um, the, we're finding the same sorts of things happening in Fukushima now with, with the trees. Uh, so here's a picture of the fir trees. The pine trees in Fukushima aren't, aren't showing this abnormality, but the fir trees are. Um, you know, basically, I use this slide to remind me that, that in, in essence, uh, every rock we turn over, sometimes literally, shows some signal of the impacts of this radioactive contamination. Uh, in both places, but especially in Chernobyl, where it's been 30 years, and so there's been time to accumulate the effects. This is one of my favorite examples. Uh, this is a so-called firebug. Uh, there are a few of these down in the States, but I don't think we have any in Toronto yet, but they're coming. They're an invasive species, but they're quite common in, in Chernobyl. And uh, it's a really handsome little bug, and one of the reasons I like it is because 
and has this, this these features. Does it remind you of anything? What does that look like? Oh, yeah. yeah, an African face mask is what you know sort of caught my attention, and and it, so because it has that facial kind of uh, structure, it's really easy to for the human uh, uh, visual system. It makes it really easy to detect deviations from symmetry, and. Um, you know, what happened was uh, my colleague and I, Anders Mahler, who's my partner in much of my research, we were in Pripyat on the 25th anniversary, April 26th, uh, 2011, uh, yeah, 2011, and uh, we were uh, giving a talk at one of the conferences in, in, in Kiev, one of the anniversary meetings, but we had the actual day off, and so we decided to go do a little field work while we were there. We were actually collecting pollen for the previous paper I mentioned, and Anders reached down on the ground and pulled up one of these little bugs. It's a nice sunny, warm day, and he shows, look, he says, Tim, look, it's a mutant. And sure enough, it was, it looked sort of like, uh, sort of this one right here, it was missing an eye. And, um, and so right then and there, we decided to start collecting all these bugs, because they were all around, and I uh, caught a few hundred that day, and sure enough, the frequency of these large abnormalities directly proportional to just how radioactive the background area was. And, and, and so, in essence, everything we look at with any kind of rigor, we find some evidence of, of the consequences. Um, this, this was one of my favorite, uh, another example of that kind of thing. This was just published earlier this year. Everybody knows the cuckoo, right? You know, the, the cuckoo, cuckoo, you know, cuckoo clocks from mm -hmm. Bavaria. Uh, how many of you have one at home or had one at home when you were growing up? It's like, you know, uh, iconic. And they're everywhere in Chernobyl. And we were, we were actually staying in the town of Chernobyl doing field work a few years ago. And uh, we were having a, a shot of vodka on the veranda one, one evening, and, which is what you do in Chernobyl. And, uh, <laughs> the, uh, um, and one of the cuckoos was calling off in the distance. And, Cuckoo was going cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. He did this strange, <laughs> sort of abbreviated. Uh, I wish I'd had a recorder, but uh, he uh, he uh, he really was very unusual sounding. And, and uh, so at that point, we decided to start counting the number of cuckoos, the number of syllables in the songs, as well as the frequency of these strange calls. And you know, you do that for two or three years. And eventually, you have enough cuckoo calls to, to write a, do an analysis <laughs> and, uh, and, and document, you know, what what you're seeing and hearing. And, and this is really what it's about. It's about documenting these things because that's what really makes the difference. And and so, uh, and and this is just to show you the actual. Let me see if this is working now. Well, we may not have audio here, right? I'm sorry, it just, it, it just has the cuckoo calling, but anyway. Um, basically, the, the frequency, uh, the length of the calling song is much shorter in more radioactive areas, and the frequency of these strange sounds is much higher in more contaminated areas. So lots of strange aberrations, lots of genetic damage, uh, and it, so it's maybe not surprising that this has a consequence for a distribution and abundance as well. And again, I'm just gonna rapidly mention a couple of studies. Basically, if you bother to go and count all the animals, in, in, in both Fukushima and, Japan, and Chernobyl, we've got, we, we have 400 locations where we do censuses <coughs> of birds and insects, and uh, have repeated these over multiple years, and the basic finding is that uh, many fewer animals in the more radioactive spots. Um, and without going into the gory details of, of how we do it, uh, but it employs statistical analyses to allow us to eliminate the potential confounding variables associated with natural variabilities, uh, which there are lots. So many fewer species when you remove all the other factors, as well as fewer individuals. In fact, in Chernobyl, 30 years later, all major groups of animals show lower number numbers. Fukushima. We started doing Fukushima, again, July of 2011, wrote a bunch of papers collected data, 400 sites, we're up to 1,900 of these, these uh, biotic inventories from these 400 different locations, and, uh, and, and basically same basic pattern. Many fewer animals in the radioactive places, many 
fewer species of animals in the more radioactive places. Uh, and if you do use, make use of these complex statistical analyses, basically you find that the dose is a very much the predictor of how many critters there's going to be. Higher doses, fewer critters. And just to make this point, uh, we don't have audio. Uh, I was going to show a couple of videos of, of, of the, uh, what it looks and sounds like. The differences are astounding. Uh, in the normal areas, you know, typical, lots of birds singing, dancing around. Uh, you get to the hot spots and basically uh, there are very, very few birds and butterflies. It's, it's really a dead zone, a silent summer, as I call it. So let me just wrap up. I'm going to skip the mammal section since, you know, just we use cameras to look at the mammals as well. And basically, the mammals are the same. Uh, Japan's kind of cool because they got monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> there are monkeys everywhere. Hmm. The other really strange thing and real difference with Chernobyl is the fact that in Japan, Google managed to get inside the Fukushima zone. So if you want to see what it really looks like, Google Earth, man. Oh, you can, really? Yeah, they, they just, I cut this on one of my cameras. And, anyway, fewer mammals and more radioactive areas. And the final question is, is there any evidence, of, since I'm an evolutionary biologist, is there any evidence of adaptation? Uh, we wrote a paper a few years ago that suggested that some of the birds may actually be doing better than expected in the more radioactive areas. And, and some of the, some journalists decided to interpret that as evidence of adaptive evolution. Uh, since it was The Economist, we didn't argue, but the, uh, <laughs> you know, the, uh, it was pretty iffy in, in terms of showing evolution. And, uh, and actually, we wrote another paper that published earlier this year that suggested that there's, there really is no evidence, based on a review of all of the studies done to date, there's no evidence, very little evidence of any kind of comprehensive uh, adaptation and so let me just jump and so what is this all so you know you've seen it all what does it mean well basically somehow we have this major difference between what these government reports suggest you know the so-called authorities on these topics uh, UNSCAR IAE Chernobyl Forum Report uh, are suggesting that that the kinds of doses associated with the Chernobyl and Fukushima disasters will ha would have no measurable consequences for for the wildlife, and yet, 100 publications later, uh, plus or minus, the the evidence is pretty overwhelming, and it's not just our data. Uh, many of these papers, as I mentioned, are meta-analyses of of the results from many other studies. So, how is it that these government organizations, these intergovernmental organizations, can uh, be so one-sided in their presentation. I, you know, it kind of blows me away. Um, but anyway, that, that's very clearly the case. Um, we're suggesting that, you know, much more research needs to be done, basic research. Uh, it's just not being done. Um, really, I, to be honest, Five years ago, I was I had a slightly different job than I have at the moment, uh, in which I actually traded in to go back to doing uh, pure research, or mostly research, because I figured there would be an explosion in research related to this question following the Fukushima disaster. Nothing could be further than the truth, uh, and uh, so I've had to really <laughs> work hard to get to get funding, and uh, but we. We've managed to do okay, but it's been really a challenge, and there's not nearly as much research being done as there should be. So we think there should be a lot more, uh, and I think this is the key point. Uh, this research can't be funded, self-funded. It can't be funded by industry. It can't. You just, you know, there's some things industry can do for itself, and certainly industry should be paying for this research in some way. But they can't be overseeing it. They can't be directing it. It can't be done by their people. Because clearly, that's not working. Anyway, with that, I will finish. Uh, 
that and just mention that of course there were lots and lots of people involved in this in this work that, that, that have played very significant roles without whom um, we couldn't have been there and uh, <coughs> move on to the next 